My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. In the name of the one who is to come, amen. In the year 1529, an 18-year-old painter in Florence named Jacopo di Pontormo, an apprentice of Leonardo da Vinci, chose as his subject the story we've just heard from Luke's Gospel, the visitation. In oil on wood, this painting is still visible in Florence in the Chapel San Michele. It captures that moment when Mary has just arrived at the house of her relative, Elizabeth. The two women, one young, one more advanced in years, are embracing. Looking at this painting, one can't help but notice that these two have on billowy robes, gorgeously colored, shades of green and orange and salmon. Elizabeth's bare feet seem to be leaving the ground as she reaches for the younger Mary. As you continue to stare at Pentormo's painting, it seems as if these two women, one old, one young, both quite pregnant, seem to be merging into one body, one floating mass of fabric and flesh. This teenaged painter to me captures something essential to Luke's story of the visitation. It's a startling moment. Mary has just arrived in haste to this Judean town in the hill country, and before Elizabeth can speak a greeting, the child Elizabeth is carrying within her leaps in immediate response. I get the sense as I read this story, as I look at this painting from 1529, that something is breaking down. And that something is an idea of the body, their bodies, our own bodies. An idea of these bodies as isolated and autonomous is breaking down. Mary arrives, Elizabeth's unborn child leaps. The shock of this moment is the shock of connection and intimacy. A realization in both women that their bodies are not their own, but caught up in a mystical connection, dependent and depended upon. This shock, this moment of connection calls forth from Mary a song that we call the Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. What Mary frames for us in this song is a new understanding of personhood. We are not souls unto ourselves, says Luke's Mary. We are living on borrowed breath. What we understand as our own souls are actually borrowed pieces of one greater soul, God's. God who is the love that began all we know, the love from which all being springs. That's why the song that Mary sings, this Magnificat, is so revolutionary. It holds up a vision of the world where no one person is a person in isolation. She has brought down the rich. She has raised up in her song the poor. The haughty are humbled. The distressed are raised up. We become God's humankind, one. It has struck me this week, as I've sat looking at this painting on my screen and hearing Luke's story about something that happened long ago in a Galilee far, far away. It has struck me this week that so often God's work begins in us through visitation, through candid and loving exchange with another person. It's where we find our courage so often, isn't it? 
Mary rushes to the home of Elizabeth. Of course she needed to be with an older relative. Of course she needs guidance, companionship. Think of what she has seen by now. Think of what she has been through. We're often shown in art a serene and aristocratic Mary listening to the angel Gabriel, her finger even marking the place in her book as if there's ever any going back to chapter 49. But Luke is also showing us a terrified and startled young woman. What an act of courage it will be to carry this baby to term. The late Jesuit priest and teacher John Cavanaugh marvels at it. What a demand upon the ego, he writes. One's time, one's plans, one's privacy. There can never again be a thought of oneself alone. One's world is now invaded by the invitations and intrusions of the unplanned visitor, the unexpected guest. As every mother knows, pregnancy is the emergence of the other within, another which is one with oneself, but not oneself. All love, Kavanaugh concludes, is born this way. All love. All love, all love is born this way, so often unexpected and intrusive at first. Now, I don't think one needs to be a pregnant woman to be transformed in this way. Some years ago, about 12 now, I went on a Saturday morning in Advent to the basement of our cathedral church on Tremont Street. It was Diocesan Discernment Day, a day set aside each year to gather and to share information with the women and men in our diocese who are considering ordained life as a deacon or a priest. The organizers in the opening moments put all of us into a large circle in Sprout Hall, and I found myself standing next to our late diocesan bishop, Tom Shaw. We were supposed to turn to our neighbor and ask some sort of assigned, non-threatening, fairly innocuous question. But Tom turned to me and he put his hand on my forearm. Tell me, Patrick, he said, how many of these have you been to by now? I'd like this to be your last one. I was, of course, startled by this because how comfortable it is sometimes to be in that place just shy of full commitment. How comfortable it is to be thinking about your future, but not yet living it. Tom sensed correctly, I think, that I was sort of casually dating my own future and not yet willing to wed it. Perhaps you've been in that condition too, in relation to your own future, a job, a move, a person who loves you. So we took our seats and the program began. A priest in this diocese, a wonderful woman named Mary Scott Wagner, got up to speak. She seemed to be about eight months pregnant. She was sipping something out of a styrofoam cup as she spoke. And she spoke casually and extemporaneously about her own life and the life of her suburban parish. All intertwined these lives. She said, when you're as pregnant as I am right now, you realize what's always true for all of us, that your body's not your own. In those words, she told me everything I needed to know. She was the older and experienced Elizabeth to my hesitating, Mary. I see that this is work that I can do joyfully for the rest of my life, she said. And as she stood there with her styrofoam cup and her brimming body, with every single word, it was, if, it was as if she was pulverizing every hesitation about my own new life that I harbored that morning. I needed a kind of courage implant to face the disruption that was to come. 
she gave it to me. Visitation, all love is born this way. As your priest who oversees pastoral ministries, I see so many of you doing this for each other over and over again. I sit every month with our bereavement support group, our cancer support group. <coughs> for the men and women in these groups, these are visitations, really. These are Mary rushing to be with Elizabeth. And the kick is the kick of new life, of life transformed, even in the face or in response to death. The older woman tells the younger woman, it was a few years before I could take the Christmas decorations out after my husband died. Don't feel obliged to be merry at Christmas. You might not be, and you won't be alone in feeling that way. For me, it got better. It took a few years. <clears throat> this past week, two members of our cancer support group met for tea in one of their kitchens in a suburb west of here. Each has cancer of the pancreas, one diagnosed last summer, one who has been treated successfully over the course of the last two years. Two women of differing but very deep faith. Two women deeply aware that healing may or may not be the same thing as the medical cure we're all praying for, for both of them. Here's what I could eat during chemo, and here's what I couldn't, are the sorts of things people like this tell each other. A slice of lemon in your mouth makes the bad taste go away. Having cancer makes you realize something you can afford not to think about when you are well. One of them says this, that this life ends and that we are all on a road to God together. All on a road to God together. This is what she does with her hands when she says that. Bodies not our own new life in the face of death. You know, perhaps I've been so deeply aware of Mary's courage this Advent because of the witness of these faithful people that I have come to know here as your priest. They offer to each other a private witness, visitation, that particularly Christian courage which in the midst of fear and disorientation and terror sees the emerging shape of new life because all love is born this way. At the same time, this fall and winter, our public world has seemed wrapped in fear and anger as Christmas approaches. The killings in Paris, in San Bernardino, have frightened so many across the world. They've frightened me too. I've needed the courage of Mary, the consolation of Elizabeth, Maybe we all do. Maybe you'll hear it now in these words of C.S. Lewis, offered to the world in 1948. Let him be, Elizabeth, to your frightened Mary. The prevailing terror when he wrote these words in 1948 was not guns or terrorism, but the possibility of spreading Soviet communism and attendant nuclear annihilation. Remember that? A new and then unfathomable terror in the world. In the midst of all of that, Lewis sang his own Magnificat, his own vision of a personal kingdom of God, a reminder that God remains with us. Here's what he wrote. The first action to be taken he wrote, is to pull ourselves together. 
If we are going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts. Not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies. A microbe can do that. But they need not dominate our minds. They need not dominate our minds the minds which God has put into each of us. We are not souls unto ourselves, says Luke's Mary. We are, in fact, living each day on borrowed breath. What we understand as our own souls are actually borrowed pieces of one greater soul, which is God's. The God who is the love that began all we know. The love from which all being springs. That love which calls us out of fear and gives us to each other. All love is born this way. Amen. <laughs>